my name is Callie Chappell and welcome to this video about the nuclear run-on transcription assay. This is made for MCDB 427, which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. So the big idea with the nuclear run-on transcription assay is we're interested in measuring the levels of transcription of one or more specific genes. We're not interested in transcription overall, but we have a particular question such as what will happen to the level of transcription of X gene when I change the environment in this way. So what we do is we're going to measure the transcription rate of a gene. And we're not going to measure just any transcription. But we're going to measure transcription from isolated nuclei. And um, this is why it's called a nuclear run-on transcription assay, of course. And so because we're using isolated nuclei, we're thinking about this in semi-in vivo conditions. And what we'll be assaying is not just transcription at any given time, but the levels of mRNA being transcribed at the time of harvest. So the big idea is that we're going to just grab, well, not really grab nuclei, but we'll, we'll take nuclei at a particular time, and we're going to ask the question, at that time, how much transcription is happening? And we're going to use uh, radioactive DNTPs and heparin to be able to answer that question. Of course, because we're doing something that involves the nucleus, we can only use eukaryotes. And generally, the types of questions that we ask with this assay are how the production of hot mRNA changes under various treatments as compared to a control. So I'm going to go pretty in-depth. I had a lot of fun drawing these diagrams, actually, about how this works. And the treatment that we're going to use is adding an activator. And you may or may not know a lot about activators right now, but really the big takeaway is that an activator we would expect to increase the level of transcription of a particular gene. So we've got our control where we don't have the activator, and we have our treatment with our activator added. And the first thing we've got to do is obviously grow the cells and then lice them. So here we go. Here are our cells growing in, this, in two different culture flasks, one without the activator, and this one I've added the activator. Activator added. And after the cells grow, we'll, we'll lice them, and then we'll pelt the nuclei in a test tube like this. And it, usually if you pellet something, the pellet looks kind of like this, but that's not so interesting. So I just wanted to draw like this just so you could kind of get the idea that there are nuclei in here. But now let's zoom in on what's going on in one of these nuclei. So within the nucleus, we've got obviously our, our DNA. And um, I'm going to zoom in on just one tiny region of the genome, and which is going to be right here. And so here we've in purple, we've got this gene that we're interested in. So remember that our, our nuclear run-on transcription assay is measuring the transcription of one or more specific genes. So when I say specific genes, this is a specific gene that in this experiment perhaps we're interested in. All right? And what's going on when I, when I kind of when I look at what is going on in the snapshot of the time of harvest, what is going on with transcription at that snapshot of time of harvest. And this is what's going on. There's transcription of this gene that's going on here um, via RNA polymerase. So here's our mRNA that's being transcribed from this gene. But, you know, at the tiny sna at the snapshot that we harvest these nuclei, this is not the only thing that's being transcribed. There are a bunch of other genes that are also being transcribed. So I'm just giving you one example here that I'm calling some gene that nobody cares about. Um, and actually, we're going to call it the beta-actin gene. And it's not really some gene that nobody cares about. It's just some gene that's not related to the gene of our interest and should not be controlled by our treatment or the, the addition of the activator. So what I've drawn here is just kind of um, the uh, transcription of this beta-actin gene that doesn't seem to be controlled by the activator. Now, let's do, we've just looked at what's going on over here. Let's jump over here. Well, when we've added the activator, we're seeing more, as we'd expect, more transcription of this gene of interest, OK, this purple, this purple gene creating these different transcripts. So the first thing we do is pelt the nuclei, and, that's, and, and, and this is kind of what's going on. But now let's actually jump into the assay. So the first thing we do is we add DNTPs, and one is radioactive. Because we're making mRNA, remember we're using DNTPs, and the one that's radioactive we typically use is alpha-labeled 32P UTP. Uh, oops, I forgot to put the alpha in there. This is alpha 32 UTP. And I've drawn these in red. I like to try to draw radioactive things in red when I can, so it's easy for you to see. So now we have the addition of these radioactive DNTPs. They get integrated into the already the already initiated mRNA mRNA transcript. So as we add um, new U's into this mRNA transcript, those U's that get integrated, as I've shown here, as like a blow up of the mRNA. Um, are radioactive, all right? So there's, there's going to be a section of the mRNA that is radioactive. But we don't just add DNTPs. And, and this is true for our gene of interest as well as all the other genes that, are be, that were being transcribed when we harvested these nuclei, okay? Including, for example, this beta-actin gene and many, many more that I've not drawn here. 
But the only thing that we add is not just DATPs, but we also add this thing called heparin. All right, and what is heparin? Well, heparin is this anionic polysaccharide, and you can think about that as a negatively charged thing. And RNA polymerase is positive, and it binds to heparin really well. And, and it binds to heparin really well because what else is negatively charged? Well, DNA is negatively charged. So because RNA polymerase binds heparin really well, it actually preferentially binds RNA polymerase um, heparin actually preferentially binds um, RNA polymerase preferentially binds heparin, excuse me, over DNA. So what happens is, that is the addition of heparin actually prevents the reassociation of RNA polymerase to DNA once it falls off. What am I talking about? All right. So transcription, the first round of transcription ends, or the trans not really the first round, but the transcription that's occurring when we harvest nuclei ends. RNA polymerase falls off, it binds to heparin, and now that RNA polymerase is bound to heparin, it can no longer hop back on the DNA and transcribe again. So what is the result? It's the result. It prevents the initiation of additional rounds of transcription. So what happens is we get a snapshot of transcription, or one round of transcription only. So remember that what, what we are interested in seeing with this nuclear run-on transcription assay is the levels of any mRNA being transcribed at the time of harvest. And so this allows that to happen. It allows us to assay transcription um, at the time of harvest because transcription already started. We add our radioactive DNTPs to finish, the, to label those transcripts that have already been started, but then not allow reassociation because of the addition of heparin. So we add heparin, we add our DNTPs, we incubate for a little while to allow the production of these, these radioactive transcripts, but not additional rounds of transcription. And then we have what we need. So now we can collect that radioactive mRNA. That's what we're really interested in, and we we can isolate it. And now remember, now remember what radio labeled mRNA we have. Not only do we have the uh, the radioactive mRNA that we want, as shown here and here. And again, remember that this treatment has the activator, so we would expect to see more trans more transcription occurring um, in this treatment, which we see here. Right, we see more transcription, not of everything, but in particular. Um, well, we would expect to see more transcription of the gene of interest, right, which I've shown here. We've got two, and here we've just got one. But we've got transcription and, and radio labeling of a bunch of other mRNA, right, like this beta-actin mRNA and a bunch of other stuff. So I've drawn that down here, where, but actually where we, we have, like, our, our RNA that we want, right, of, like, various quantities based on the treatment, but we also have a bunch of other stuff. We have this beta-actin that's, that's being transcribed at equal levels on, on, in both in both treatments because that shouldn't be affected by the addition of that activator and a bunch of many 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 other labeled mRNAs which I've drawn here right many 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 other mRNAs but we don't care about these other mRNAs we don't care about those all we care about is this RNA that we want that's RNA that we want that I circled here in orange so how do we quantify just our mRNA of interest when we've got a bunch of other mRNAs that are labeled and the way that we typically do this in a run-on transcription assay is by using a is using what's called a dot blot. All right, and I'm gonna call it a dot blot, but you also might hear about this modification of the dot blot called the slot blot. A slot blot. Let me write that out. A slot blot. And the only difference between a dot blot, blot and a slot blot, well, this is hard to say, is how you actually put on the DNA onto this filter. So let me talk about it generally first. So what we've got is we've got a filter, which I've, shown, which I've shown here, and we've got three different dots. It doesn't have to be three. You can have more than three or less than three. But I'm just going to show you what happens in three different, in three different scenarios. The first is, um, and, and on each dot, we've got this single-stranded denatured DNA that's cold. That means it's not radio-labeled, and it's an excess. And so in the first dot, we've got a cDNA from our gene of interest. All right? And why use cDNA from our gene of interest? Well, we're interested in just... Grabbing this, we want to preferentially see the levels of this being produced at any given time. And so we want something that this can anneal to, so we can get it to hybridize this piece of paper and look at it, right? It's an easy way to separate out what we want from what we don't want by finding something that is um, that is complementary to that. So we're going to use the single-stranded denatured DNA in order to do that, and specifically it's, it's cDNA from that gene of interest, all right? This spot is going to be for beta-actin. So this is why, why am I bringing a beta-actin in the first place? Well, we're going to use it as our positive control. Now, what is a positive control in this context? Why would we be interested in that? Well, it's something that we would think will hybridize to, to, this, to the beta-actin Right to this beta actin on this um, dot blot, but we but we 
do not want it to change based on our experimental conditions, right? So we wouldn't expect to see a difference in level of transcription if there's this activator that's specific to our gene of interest in beta actin. So we just want to make sure that everything is working and that we can actually see something. That's why you use a positive control. And finally is the negative control. And the negative control is just some nonspecific DNA that shouldn't have any mRNA that hybridize to it at all. So we want to make sure that there's not just, uh, we want to make sure that everything is not, is not hybridizing to our dot plot. It's specific to what we're interested in. So if we use a negative control, we would expect to see nothing hybridized to this negative control. And we're going to use the same dot plot for both treatments. So now that I've kind of set up the dot plot for you, what we do is we take all of these mRNAs that we've, that we've, uh, that we've um, purified, that we've isolated, and not really purified, but we've, we've isolated um, from everything else that's in those nuclei. And we're going to put it on our filter, all right? And as I said before, because what's on these dots are these single-stranded denatured DNAs, if, the, uh, if, if we're adding mRNA that is complementary to what's on each of these dots, it will stick and everything else will just kind of float around there, right? But, keep, but what if I visualize this? just as it is. I didn't do anything else to it. Well, all I'd see is radioactivity everywhere. Because there's so many mRNAs that are just around that are also radioactive, um, what will happen is everything will look radioactive. So there's a key step that happens after that, and that's we have to wash it. We have to wash this filter so only the things that are actually hybridizing will still stick. And so I've drawn that down here, all right? So only the things that are specially hybridizing will stick. So let me point out, let me go dot by dot, and then we'll compare these two. All right, so here we go. In this dot, we have our um, our cDNA that is specific to our gene of interest, and 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 I've actually increased the numbers that I used up here because I just one didn't seem like enough to me. So, but this is still in proportion, right? So now I've got we've got two that were produced perhaps overall here, and four that were produced overall here, and so. Two um, mR, and, and obviously it's not realistic. Obviously, in an in, in actual experiment, you have way more than two. I'm just showing you so we can do some comparisons here. So let's just say two uh, mRNA, radioactive mRNA, were produced, and so two are hybridizing to this dot on the dot blot. All right? And now let's take a look at this positive control, beta actin. Let's just say that four beta actin mRNA were produced here. Um, and they hybridized to the single-stranded DNA, beta-active DNA that were on this dot. And then here uh, we have, remember, this is the negative control, so it's this nonspecific DNA that we wouldn't expect to have any mRNAs hybridizing to it, and indeed we don't have any mRNAs hybridizing to it, so this looks like this works. Let's take a look at what's happening here. So remember, this treatment is where we have the addition of our activator, so we would expect to see a higher level of transcription of our gene of interest shown here in yellow. So indeed we do. We see that there was more, there was more mRNA produced um, or transcribed from this gene with the activator. So we're seeing four hybridizing instead of two. And the reason why there's more is because more were produced, not because for some reason hybridize is better here. Now for our positive control, just like we saw over here, we see three beta actin mRNA hybridizing, and that's as we expect for the positive control, right? We would expect it to be um, being produced at basal levels in both cases, unaffected by the addition of the activator. And finally, the negative control, like over here, shouldn't have anything hybridizing to it, and indeed it does not. So the last step we're going to do is actually visualize this. So when we visualize these gels, we can quantify, or um, yeah, we can quantify how much radioactivity we have, and 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 the, the the amount of radioactivity we quantify is is proportional to the amount of mRNA of interest that is on each dot. So here we see that we've got two. We have two. Um, MR, oh, actually, I kind of this is a little bit hard to see. This is this should be lighter. It should be a little bit darker. Um, we see two mRNA here. So this is this color. We see more mRNA hybridizing here. So this should be darker. This should actually be all the way black. And then there's no mRNA, radioactive mRNA, hybridizing to this dot, so we don't see anything. And similarly over here, we've got four mRNA that's hybridizing to this dot, so we see a dark black mark here, lots of radioactivity. We also see four here, so actually I should have drawn this where this was the same color as this. 
who these two things were the same color. They're both dark. And finally, here again, nothing and nothing is hybridizing to it. No radioactive mRNA is hybridizing, so we don't see a dot there. And so we can compare the level of transcription, right? So these two, because these two are controls, they should be the same between the two treatments, right? They shouldn't differ between treatments. The only thing that should differ is our is our actual treatment blot, right? So remember the blot that has the cDNA to the gene of interest. And here we see that yes, more transcription occurred here than here because this is there's more radioactivity or this is darker than there is here, which indicates that yes, the activators seem to increase the amount of transcription um, on this treatment, right? And the way that we did that was by using this run-on transcription assay. I hope this video was helpful to help explain what's going on here, and I hope to see you in future videos.